Hello. Today we are going to read The Sun, all about solar flares, eclipses, sunspots, and more. And it's by Seymour Simon. And there is an author's note. There's no illustration. It says, from a young age, I was interested in animals, space, my surroundings, all the natural sciences. When I was a teenager, I became the president of a na nationwide junior astronomy club with a thousand members. After college, I became a classroom teacher for nearly 25 years while also writing articles and books for children on science and nature even before I became a full-time writer. My experience as a teacher gives me the ability to understand how to reach my young readers and get them interested in the world around us. I've written more than 250 books and I've thought a lot about different ways to encourage interest in the natural world, as well as how to show the joys of nonfiction. When I write, I use comparisons to help explain unfamiliar, unfamiliar ideas, complex concepts, and impossibly large numbers. I try to engage your senses and imagination to set the scene and to make science fun. For example, in penguins, I emphasize the playful nature of these creatures on the very first page by mentioning how penguins excel at swimming and diving. I use strong verbs to enhance understanding. I make use of descriptive detail and ask questions that anticipate what you may be thinking, sometimes right at the start of the book. Many of my books are photo essays, which use extraordinary photographs to amplify and expand the text, creating different and engaging ways of exploring nonfiction. You'll also find a glossary, an index, and website, and research recommendations in most of my books, which make them ideal for enhancing your reading and learning experience. As William Blake wrote in his poem, I want my readers to see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wildflower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand, and eternity in an hour. And he signed his name, Seymour Simon. So that's what the author wrote. That's really cool because he and I have like the same goal. We want to try to get you interested in our world um, in different ways. So um, I, I think I like this guy already, but I want you to go ahead. We're going to go ahead and check out this book. All right. The sun is a star. It is a medium-sized star, but the sun appears bigger and brighter than other stars because it is so much closer to us. The sun is about 93 million miles or 150 million kilometers away from Earth. The next closest star is about 25 trillion, that was with a T, trillion miles or 40 trillion kilometers away. Although scientists can see countless stars through telescopes, the sun is the only star that can study, they can study closely. So it's our closest star that we can study, the sun. The sun is at the center of the solar system. There are eight planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, and Uranus. That's weird, you put them in the wrong order. Should go Uranus, Neptune. Anyway, in the solar system that travel around the sun in paths called orbits. Many of the planets have moons orbiting around them. Earth is the third closest planet to the sun. Pluto, now called a dwarf planet, is almost 4 billion miles from the sun. From far away, Pluto, the sun looks only like a bright star in a dark sky. There are thousands of, of smaller objects called asteroids that orbit the sun. These lumps of rock, which range in size from pebbles to nearly 500 miles across, circle the sun in a broad asteroid belt between the orbits of the planets, Mars and Jupiter. You can see asteroid belt here. Many smaller rocks and snowballs also travel around the sun in orbits, other than the asteroid belt. Finally, there are many comets orbiting the sun. Comets are clumps of ice and dust that warm up and produce shining tails when they come near the sun. Whoop, getting comfy. <laughs>
The sun is huge compared to Earth. If the sun were hollow, it could hold 1.3 million Earths. Think of this. If Earth were the size of a golf ball, then the sun would be a globe about 15 feet across. In fact, the sun is nearly 600 times bigger than all the planets in the solar system put together. Mm. So that's interesting. It's, it's definitely really big to us. It's way bigger than our Earth. So it could put 1.3 million Earths inside the sun. But at the same time, it just said on the other page that the sun is a medium-sized star. So it's huge to us, but it's not even the biggest star. It just looks so big because it's so close. The sun's light and heat come from fires deep within it. But the sun doesn't burn the same way as a fire does on Earth. If the sun were just a huge bonfire, it would have burned out long ago. Instead, the sun is more like an endless hydrogen bomb. About five billion years ago, a, cloud, a huge cloud of dust and hydrogen gas began to pull together, forming a globe. As the gas and dust packed together more and more tightly, the globe became hot enough to set off a chain of nuclear explosions, and the sun began to shine. These explosions are still going on. Hydrogen is the sun's fuel. The sun converts about 4 million tons of hydrogen into energy every second. Still, the sun has enough hydrogen to continue shining for another 5 to 6 billion years. That's a lot. So what's inside the sun? Of course, no spaceship could travel there. Every material we know would be instantly destroyed by the intense heat but let's use the spaceship of our mind to explore the sun. At the very center of the sun is its core. So there's the core. The sun's core is about as big as the planet Jupiter, about 100,000 miles across. By the way, Jupiter is the largest planet in our solar system. So the core of the sun is still just about that size of our largest planet. Okay, um, here a constant here, constant nuclear explosions turn hydrogen gas invis into invisible X-ray and gamma ray energy. Temperatures in the core may reach as nearly as high as 27 million degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, 27 million degrees Fahrenheit. That's really hot. Uh, you know what boiling is in Fahrenheit? 212 degrees. So 27 million degrees is way beyond boiling. That's why we can't even get close to the sun, okay? And that's just in the core. Um, so around the core are two layers, the radiative zone and the convec convective zone, which make up most of the sun's interior. Here, X-rays and gamma rays from the core move outward toward the surface and finally change to visible light. In space, these rays move at the speed of light, 186 thousand miles per second. So that's something we're going to talk about later on when we talk about light energy. But some of this other stuff about the sun, we don't have to know, but it is kind of just interesting to learn about. Um, so just know that some of this stuff, if, it, if you're like, whoa, what's she talking about? Um, just know some of this is a little bit higher level than, than what we're learning about in fifth grade science, but that's okay. We can hear it. Um, and then the things that are repeated are really those things that we need to know about the sun like that it's the biggest star and our, it's, it's our star, you know, it's the largest one to us um, because it's closest to us. It's what pulls us, you know, our grab gives us that gravitational pull. We orbit it. Um, but just know that if you, if you're hearing some things that are confusing you, it's okay. This is just kind of, some of it's a little bit higher level. It's okay. All right. So, um, but inside the sun, x-rays and gamma rays are greatly slowed down by the tightly packed gases. It takes energy rays in the sun millions of years to reach the sun's surface. The photosphere is a sea of churning gases that make up the sun's surface. The photosphere means, photo means light, is what we see when we look at the sun in the sky. So look, we got the photosphere. So when you see the sun in the sky, that's what you see. Okay, warning, never look directly at the sun. The direct rays of the sun can injure your eyes. So I know sometimes you want to, don't do it. <laughs> the temperature of the photosphere is about 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. 
but there are some hotter areas that form on the surface, just like bubbles in boiling water. All right, so let's look at this real quick. So we've got our different parts. There's the convective zone, uh, prominence, radiative zone, the core, the sunspots, photosphere, the um, coronal hole, the chromosphere, the corona, the flare. Um, those are all parts we don't need to know about the sun, but it is interesting to to know that the sun is like that, that's kind of in parts. And we talk about parts of the earth too, you know, those different layers. All right, so we're gonna keep going here. Um, this is a little bit back to where we're going. <laughs> um, like earth, the sun has an atmosphere, a cloud of ga gases surrounding it. The sun's inner atmosphere is called the chromosphere. Chroma means color. We usually can't see the chromosphere because it is hidden in the bright glare of the sun's surface. However, the chromosphere does become visible during a total eclipse of the sun. A solar eclipse takes place when the moon comes between Earth and the sun, blocking out light from the sun. For a few minutes, only the sun's atmosphere is visible. So look, we've got the sun, the moon's in the middle, and then Earth. So um, the moon is blocking that sunlight, and this is what we would see. So the photo of a solar eclipse shows the pink layer of the chromosphere shining around the moon's dark disk. So that's the moon, and then that light is coming from the sun. So also stuff we don't really need to know, but it's just interesting. Surrounding the chromosphere is the sun's outer atmosphere, the corona. The sun's corona is made up of thin gases that are very, very hot, almost 3 million degrees Fahrenheit. The corona stretches outward for millions of miles into space. And during a total solar eclipse, the corona looks like a halo or crown of light. So, and if you know, um, if you habla espanol, um, you know, corona means crown in Spanish. So there is that. Scientists have discovered another way to study the sun's corona. They use a coronagraph, an, instru an instrument that blocks out the sun's surface. This allows them to photograph and study the corona over a long period of time not just for a few minutes of a solar eclipse. Did you check out the solar eclipse a couple years ago? Um, they had all those special glasses and everything. I know some people travel to different parts of the country to get a better view. Um, so did you do that? I know I was at school and we went out and looked. It was right before school started. All right. This coronagraph shows the faint edge of a, cor of a coronal a coronal, sorry, mass ejection, or a CME, a massive burst of solar wind as it races away from the sun and is released into space. You can also see the corona in this image. Hmm. Interesting, lots of different parts of the sun. The sun is never at rest. Sometimes giant star storms called sunspots erupt on the surface. These storms look like dark spots or blotches as you can see in the photograph here. Solar storms, which come in a variety of types, including sunspots, CMEs, solar flares, and erupting prominences, send powerful streams of magnetic energy into space. The energy released in one hour by this storm is equal to all the electrical power that will probably be used in the United States over the next million years. <laughs> The number of sunspots changes over an 11 year period called the sunspot, sunspot cycle. During a year when the sun is quiet, large sunspots appear very rarely. During a year when the sun is active, as many as 100 large sunspots appear. So what causes sunspots? The sun is like a giant magnet with north and south uh, magnetic poles. Sunspots occur when powerful magnetic storms break out on the sun's surface and prevent some heat and light from escaping. That's why spots are darker than their surroundings. This photo shows two views of the same sunspot activity. The image on the bottom is called a magnetogram right here. It shows that each pair of sunspots has both a north and south pole. The gray areas indicate that there is no magnetic field while the yellow and green areas indicate regions where there is a strong magnetic field. 
a magnetic force over 1,000 times stronger than the magnetic field on the surface of Earth runs between the North and South Poles and stretches in a loop up in the sun's atmosphere. So just some interesting facts, some little extras. <laughs> the magnetic forces erupting out of the sunspot sometimes carry hot gases with them. These flaming streams of gas are called prominences. Traveling at speeds up to 200 miles per second, prominences arch up through the sun's atmosphere. Some prominences fly off into space, but all loop back to the sun, at least when they are first born. Sometimes we don't see the full loop because only a portion of the gas is glowing, but scientists are pretty sure that the invisible magnetic field loops back. Some of them erupt and splay out into space, but even those started as loops. Many prominences are over 100,000 miles long and 3,000 miles thick, yet they can rise and fall in just a few hours. Other prominences last for days or even weeks. This photograph shows the magnetic loops that carry the hot gases of prominences. So, you know, the sun is like the rest of our solar system. It's super difficult to study because it's so far away, but this one is even more problematic because um, it's so hot that we would, you know, <laughs> we couldn't even get close to it to, to study it. So sometimes the magnetic forces in a large sunspot are released in fiery explosions called flares. Flares last for only a few minutes, yet can have the power of 10 million hydrogen bombs. These violent explosions send out intense waves of heat, light, and other forms of radiant energy. When solar storms such as solar flares or CMEs hit Earth a few days later, they can black out communications and cause the magnetic compasses on airplanes and ships to spin wildly for a short time. Yeah, I know a couple years ago we were having issues with that and um, some airplanes couldn't fly to some places. They had to take a break. Flares also send great numbers of tiny particles out into space. Some of these particles reach Earth and become trapped in Earth's magnetic field near the North and South Poles. As these particles come down through our atmosphere, they make the air glow in shimmering multicolored curtains of light called auroras. In the north, this is called the aurora borealis, or northern lights, as shown in the photo on the right. In the south, it is called the aurora australis, or southern lights. The sun is important to life on Earth. Our weather and climate depend on the sun. Green plants need sunlight to grow. Animals eat plants for food, and we need plants and animals to live. Even the fuels we use, such as coal, oil, and gas, are the remains of once living things. Without the sun, there would be no heat, no light, no clouds, no rain, no living thing on Earth. And that's the end. So um, I like all of the information that we got about the sun. Remember, there's a lot in here that's a little bit... Um, higher level than fifth grade, but it's okay. Um, maybe this is something that interests you and you want to um, find out more about those things. So we're going to be looking at the sun and those different, those important parts that we need to know, like how it is our star, it's closest to us. And even though it looks the biggest and it's the biggest to us, it's really only a medium sized star. So um, we are going to learn more about it. I hope you enjoyed this story. Take care. Peace. <laughs>